<clears throat> All right, so picking up with two principles that you should have read about chapter 14. All right, so one is called the principle of independent assortment. The other is called principle of segregation. Now, these are concepts that tie in with meiosis. All right, so looking at independent assortment. <clears throat> so during this process of independent assortment, your chromosomes will line up along the metaphase plate during meiosis one. Your homologous pairs will line up along the metaphase plate in meiosis one in one arrangement or another, or another, or another, depending on the different combinations you can have. All right, for this example, <clears throat> we have two, two pairs of chromosomes. All right, so we have one to carry the R gene, and one to carry the Y gene. All right, so the ones that carry the R gene, we're gonna say our paternal chromosomes are, we'll say the blue chromosomes, and then we'll say our maternal are the ones in red. Okay, so since we have a nice little homologous pair, all right, for gene R, we have one chromosome from dad, one chromosome from mom. For gene Y, we have one chromosome from <clears throat> dad, one from Y. All right, so we're looking at two homologous pairs for four total chromosomes in number for this example. Now, in terms of independent assortment, you could have it so that both paternal chromosomes are on the left side and both maternal chromosomes are on the right. So in terms of the metaphase plate, all right, that means that the maternal chromosomes will pass on to the daughter cell on the right, paternal daughter cell on the left at the end of meiosis. All right. Now you can have a different situation where one of your paternal chromosomes is on the left side and one of your maternal chromosomes is on the left side. All right, so the paternal chromosome for gene R is on the left, the maternal chromosome for gene, maternal chromosome for gene Y is on the left, the maternal chromosome for gene R is on the right, <clears throat> and the paternal chromosome for gene Y is on the right. All right, so we have an interesting combination of genes just based on how they line up during metaphase one. All right, so this alone can lead to genetic variation. So again, as these chromosomes will end up in their daughter cells respectively. All right, you get a daughter cell with paternal gene R and maternal gene Y, maternal gene R, paternal gene Y. So you can get very unique combinations of genes this way, depending all on how these chromosomes line up during metaphase one. Now, Looking at this principle of segregation. All right, so principle of segregation has to do with anaphase one of meiosis. All right, so here we have our <clears throat> chromosomes that have lined up at the metaphase plate. All right, and they segregate independently from one another, all right? Ideally, they segregate independently from one another, all right? So they're, so we're only looking at one, one chromosome pair, all right? These chromosome pairs segregate independent of one another. All right, so one goes into one daughter cell, the other goes into the other. Now, 
One of the terms that you're going to come across is wild type. All right, so a wild type trait is the one that is the most predominant in the population. Now, a wild type, wild type, a wild type trait. This trait can either be a dominant trait or it can be a recessive trait. Just because a trait is recessive doesn't mean that it's the most predominant trait in the population. All right, so to give you some examples, all right, having freckles is a dominant phenotype. Not having freckles is a recessive phenotype. Having a widow's peak is dominant over having a straight hairline. Having a free earlobe is dominant over having a an attached earlobe. Now, what about these recessive traits? Well, wild type trait would be that we all have five fingers and toes, right? Most of us do. That's a wild type trait in the population. But that wild type trait is recessive to have five fingers and toes. All right. The dominant phenotype, the dominant trait is polydactyly. So having more than five digits, five fingers or five toes, that's the dominant trait. But you don't see it predominantly in the population. Okay, so most of us in the population are, for all intents and purposes, homozygous recessive for this particular phenotype, all right, because we have five fingers and toes on each hand or foot. <clears throat> Another example is syndactyly, all right. The wild type phenotype is that our digits, all right, during, during embryonic development, our digits will initially be fused, they're webbed, all right, but the, the skin that's connecting the digits will actually undergo apoptosis and be degenerated, destroyed, so that now there's no longer any webbing. All right, so wild type is that we have no webbed digits, all right? The Dominant trait, syndactyly, means you do have webbed digits. All right, so again, for all intents and purposes, we're homozygous recessive. We exhibit the recessive phenotype. So in this case, the recessive phenotype for this trait is the one that's predominant in the population. So looking at <clears throat> conditions that are the result of recessive inheritance, all right, so albinism, all right, so individuals who exhibit albinism are homozygous recessive for the albinism alleles, all right, so here <clears throat> you have two parents that are normal, all right? But they're each a carrier for this albinism allele, all right? Which is the recessive allele, all right? So both parents are what we call carriers, all right? So one parent can contribute a normal and an albino allele. The other parent can contribute a normal and an albino allele, combining these together in your Punnett square, and you get a three to one ratio. All right, so there's a 
75% chance that the offspring could be normal and a 25% chance that they are albino. <clears throat> Another condition is sickle cell anemia. All right, so individuals who have sickle cell anemia, all right, are going to have two copies of these sickle cell alleles. All right, so little c, little c. All right, so these individuals, there's a abnormality in their their beta subunits of their hemoglobin that causes the hemoglobin molecules to basically polymerize and it forms these these fibrils of hemoglobin proteins and so they're inefficient in transporting oxygen and so this these fibers within the red blood cells cause the red blood cells to form this sickle shape which leads to its own complications all right, so individuals with this condition have weakness, anemia, pain, fever, and eventually uh, organ damage. All right. Now, <clears throat> individuals who are heterozygous. All right, now, we're going to talk about an interesting thing here. Individuals that are heterozygous, they have one copy of a normal allele, and they have one copy of the sickle cell allele. All right, so they would have this respective little genotype. So that means half their blood cells form this little fibril, half the red blood cells are sickle shaped, half of them are normal. So they're not, they're able to transport oxygen, but not as efficiently as someone who is normal, but more so better than someone who has both copies of sickle cell alleles. All right. <clears throat> But there is a heterozygous advantage here, whereby individuals that are heterozygous, yes, you do have some debilitating effects due to the sickle cell allele, all right, but you have a, a certain degree of protection from contracting malaria. All right, so these individuals that are heterozygous for this particular condition are particularly resistant to contracting malaria. All right, because the malaria parasite targets erythrocytes. <clears throat> now, looking at a condition for a dominant Right. All right, so in this case, individuals to, that exhibit this condition, for, for our example, achondroplasia. All right, so here we're looking at the Roloff family. All right, and Zachary suffers from achondroplasia along with his, his parents. And there's all different forms of dwarfism, so we're only looking at achondroplasia. All right, so here you have a normal non achondroplasia individual. All right, these individuals are homozygous recessive. All right, now the dwarf that has achondroplasia is heterozygous. All right, that means that Matt's heterozygous, Amy's heterozygous, Zachary's heterozygous. All right, because individuals that suffer for achondroplasia, if they had this genotype, all right, two copies of this dominant allele is lethal. All right, so this one you make it to full term. All right, so individuals with achondroplasia are going to be heterozygous. All right, so crossing a heterozygous individual with one that is <clears throat> normal. 
right, you end up with a 50-50 ratio, where there's a 50% chance that your offspring is going to be a dwarf, and 50% chance that they're going to be normal. All right, so now <clears throat> we're going to discuss some non-Mendelian non -Mendelian genetics topics. All right, so these are going to be traits that Mendel had nothing to deal with because he was very lucky. All right, Mendel was lucky in the fact that he chose a plant that was exhibiting either dominant or recessive phenotype, right? That there were basically either a dominant allele or a recessive allele, all right? And that the, the particular plants exhibited what we call complete dominance, that the dominant allele was completely dominant over the recessive allele. And that for all of his varieties, we had dominant or recessive for all the traits he examined, all right? Which is really nice. And that all the traits he was looking at, that each of the genes responsible for each of the things, each of the characteristics he was examining, each of the traits. <clears throat> so, like the gene for um, petal color, the flowers, versus uh, flower petal position on the plant, those were on separate chromosomes. So, he did have to worry about gene linkage, all right? The traits he looked at, you, you saw the example of the reciprocal cross. You saw that it didn't matter whether or not he crossed a male flower with a female flower for purple versus white, or a female flower with a male flower with purple versus white, because you got the same outcome every time. as a result of that cross. They exhibited the dominant phenotype. All right, so in this case, there was no, <clears throat> none of the genes were found on sex chromosomes. None of them were sex linked. All right, so now we're gonna talk about sex linked traits. So eye color, all right, eye color and fruit flies. Eye color and fruit flies is a sex linked trait. All right, the wild type phenotype. All right, if you do, if you were to go out and look at the flies, fruit flies, the population. All right, most of them would have the wild type phenotype. They'd be, they'd have red eyes. All right, a mutant phenotype would be one where, for example, they would have white eyes. <clears throat> All right, so genes that are located on sex chromosomes are termed sex-linked. All right, so genes that are found on either the X or the Y chromosome are sex-linked genes. All right, so here, looking at a male. A male producing gametes. Half of its gametes, ideally, will have an X chromosome, and half is other gametes will have a Y chromosome. All right, this is an ideal situation, theoretically. All right, it should be 50-50. That's the expected outcome. All right, so here, let's look at, for example, eye color. Alright, so here, alright, we have a female fruit fly. Alright, so in terms of sex chromosomes, the complement of sex chromosomes in a fruit fly for sex is the same for human. So XX female, XY male. Alright, so here, these particular uh, genes for eye color are found on the X chromosome, all right? 
So here, looking at eye color, all right, red versus white, the dominant trait is red eyes, all right, indicated by capital W. It's red. Little w is white. Okay. All right, so for this example, we have a pure breeding white female and a a pure breeding a purebred red-eyed female and a purebred white-eyed male. All right, so here when you do this cross, all the offspring. All right, so a female can only contribute a X chromosome with a red eye allele. A male can contribute a X chromosome with a white allele and a Y chromosome. All right, so half of your offspring are gonna have, I mean male, half are female. All right, it's 50-50, it's always 50-50. All right, it's always a 50% chance that your child is either gonna be male or female. Okay. 100% of the offspring produced have red eyes. All right, so let's look at some symbols. All right, this symbol is indicative of a female. This symbol is indicative of a male. All right, it's pointed, it's phallic shaped, it's male, okay? So red-eyed female crossed with a white-eyed male. All the offspring have red eyes, which is what we see here, okay? Now, what if we were to do a reciprocal cross? All right, so what if now our female was a purebred white-eyed female? So this means both X chromosomes have a copy of the white eye allele, and for the male, the red eye allele is found on the X chromosome, and it has a Y chromosome, all right, so here, the female can only contribute in her gametes or eggs the recessive allele. The male can contribute a dominant allele on the X chromosome and a Y chromosome. All right, so now it's a 50-50% a chance that it's either red eyes or white eyes. All right, so you get a different result in this reciprocal cross, whether the traits being passed on from the male or the female, right? Whether or not the female has a dominant trait or the male has a dominant trait, you're seeing a difference, all right? If these were the same, you would think that it's not sex-linked. But the fact that you see a difference as a result of this reciprocal cross, this is telling you that it's quite possible that these genes are sex-linked. <clears throat> now, what would happen if we crossed this male, red-eyed male, with this red-eyed female? What would be the result of that cross? Alright, well here, our male. Our male can contribute a a copy of the red eye allele and a white chromosome. Our female contributes a copy of the red eye allele and a copy of the white eye allele. All right, so this is an example of the cross between the mom and the, and the dad. Here, we're looking at the, the progeny of that cross. Here. Now, if we cross these two individuals, all right, the male contributes a, a red eye 
allele on the X chromosome and a Y chromosome. The female contributes a red eye allele on the X chromosome and a white eye allele on the X chromosome. All right, so you get a a three to one ratio of red to white. All right, now. 75% chance your offspring's going to have red eyes, 25% chance they're going to have white eyes. Now, if they're female, it's a 100% chance they're going to have red eyes. If they're male, it's a 50% chance they'll have red eyes and a 50% chance they'll have white eyes. All right, so here we're looking at our cross. All right, we have a a wild type, true breeding female with red eyes, and a white-eyed male. All right, so here, 100% of the offspring are going to have red eyes. Red-eyed females, red-eyed males. Here, if you have a female that has a copy of both the red eye allele and white eye allele, and a male that has red eyes. Through this cross, all right, your female can contribute in her eggs a copy of the red eye allele or a copy of the white eye allele on the X chromosome. The male can contribute a red eye allele and a white chromosome. All right, so here it's three to one. All right, so there's a 75% chance that your offspring is going to have red eyes. 25% chance it's going to have, going to have, red, have white eyes. Now, it's a, if it's a female, there's a 100% chance that it's going to have red eyes. And if it's a male, it's a 50% chance for red eyes and a 50% chance for white eyes if it's male. Now what happens if you cross a red-eyed female with a, a white-eyed male? And the female is got a copy of the red-eye and white-eye alleles. Well here, your female can contribute in her eggs copy the red or white allele. Your male can contribute a copy of the white eye allele on X chromosome and a Y chromosome. All right, so here, it's a 50% chance that you're gonna have offspring with red eyes, 50% chance you're gonna have offspring with white eyes. Now, if you're a male, it's a 50% it's a chance you have red or white eyes. If you're a female, it's a 50% chance you're gonna have red or white eyes. Now, looking at photoreceptors, all right, so this ties in beautifully with our discussion about photosynthesis, all right, you'll recall that I put up a picture of the light absorption spectrum of the human eye and compare that to the light absorption spectrum of plants. And recall that the light absorption spectrum was pretty narrow for the eye. It resembled this. All right, so it was a very narrow band. Well, remember I told you guys that you have only two main types of photoreceptors. You have photoreceptors for basically light, dark, you know, white, black light, shades, shades of gray, and you have photoreceptors for color. Right. So here you're looking at three different types of cones for color. All right, so you're looking at blue, green, and red light. So absorption of blue light, absorption of red light, absorption of red light. And this basically makes up the majority of the spectrum 
that the light utilizes, or that the eyes utilize from the visible light spectrum. You'll notice that these pigment molecules are embedded in a membrane. All right, there's rhodopsin. The rhodopsin is the pigment in the eyes. All right, it's embedded in a membrane. All right. Very similar to the pigment molecules like chlorophyll and keratinoids. They're embedded in the membrane of the thylakoid. All right, so there's a lot of similarities here. All right, so looking at color blindness. All right, so we have red-green color blindness, right? That's one of the more common typical types of color blindness, but there's all different variants of color blindness. All right, so we have normal vision where we see red, green, and blue. There are individuals that can't see red, can't see green, can't see blue. All right, there's individuals that can only see, they can't see low red, they can't see low green, can't see low blue. Individuals who can't see any color at all, so monochromacy. All right, so for an individual with normal vision, you'll see green is green, yellow is yellow, and red is red. If you're colorblind, all right, and you can't see green or red, so you're red, green, colorblind, Right? You'll perceive these colors of green and red as shades of yellow. Yellow is yellow, but green is yellow and red is yellow. Alright, so this is a little bit of a test on the side that's utilized for determining whether or not an individual has a potential um, colorblind condition. <laughs> Alright, so here, looking at colorblindness. So colorblindness in humans is a sex-linked trait. Alright, so <laughs> here we have <clears throat> two alleles. Alright, we have the dominant allele which produces functioning light-sensitive proteins. And we have the recessive allele that produces defective light-sensitive proteins. All right, so for a male to be colorblind, you have to have one copy of the recessive allele on the X chromosome. All right, because you only have one X chromosome, you exhibit this phenotype. Females have to have two copies of the recessive allele to exhibit color blindness. Normal vision in males, we have to have one copy of the dominant allele. Females can have either two copies of the dominant allele or a copy of the dominant and a copy of the recessive. All right, in this case, the dominant allele is going to be expressed over the recessive. All right, so here, let's look at a cross between a normal female and a colorblind male. All right, so capital N is for normal vision. Lowercase n is for abnormal vision, colorblindness. All right, so big N, normal, little n, All right, so we have a female that has two copies of a normal allele on her X chromosomes. And we have a colorblind male who has a copy of the recessive allele on his X chromosome. All right, so here, when you do the cross, all right, you're going to end up with a 50-50% chance that your offspring are either going to be carriers 
or be unaffected. Now, if you have a daughter, your daughters will have normal vision, but they'll be carriers for the colorblind allele. If you have a male, your male will have normal vision. So all the males will have normal vision. Now, what if you have a female who's a carrier and you have a male with normal vision? Now, as a result of this cross, all right, it's going to be that it's a 75% chance your offspring will have normal vision, a 25% chance they'll have this colorblind condition. Now, if you have a daughter, your daughter is either going to be normal and not a carrier or normal and a carrier. All right, so it's a 50% chance that your daughters are either going to be normal and not a carrier for colorblind allele or they'll be normal and carry a copy of the colorblind allele. If you're a male, it's a 50% chance that you're going to be normal or be colorblind. Now, how can you explain this situation? How is it that the mother is not colorblind, the father isn't colorblind, but the son is? Well, think about it. Male sons get their Y chromosome from their dad. You get your X chromosome for your mom. So that means if your mom is a carrier, that means that she gives you a copy of the colorblind allele on her X chromosome, or has the potential to. Because we receive our X chromosomes as males from our moms. We receive our Ys from our dads. Daughters get their X chromosome from one from mom, one from dad. Alright, so here we're looking at another condition that is sex linked. Alright, so hemophilia. Alright, so again, this is a, a recessive phenotype. Alright, so individuals that are normal don't suffer from hemophilia, it's a dominant phenotype. Individuals that have the recessive allele have hemophilia. All right, so here, if you have a father, a father who is normal, all right, has a copy of the normal allele on his X chromosome, and you have a mother that is a carrier, As a result of this cross, all right, 50% of your sons can either have normal blood clotting factors or have abnormal blood clotting factors and suffer from hemophilia. Daughters, it's a 50% chance that your daughters are going to be either carriers have that phenotype or be normal. Now, if you have a father that's hemophiliac, 
All right, he has this genotype. Now let's say that we have a mother that's normal. All right, the offspring of this cross. All right, your sons are gonna be normal. All right, I think their Y chromosome from their dad and their mom contributes the X chromosome. All right, the daughters are going to be carriers. For this hemophiliac allele. All right, so let's look at a nice little pedigree for hemophilia. All right, so Queen Victoria, she is a carrier carrier for the hemophilia allele. Albert is normal; doesn't suffer from hemophilia. So neither parent suffers from hemophilia. Alice, their daughter, is a carrier. Lewis, who marries Alice, is normal. Alexandra, their daughter, is normal as a carrier for the hemophilia allele. Sir Nicholas has normal hemophilia allele. Alexis. Alexis got his X chromosome from his mom, Y chromosome from his dad, and suffered from hemophilia. Now, in females, on the X chromosome, all right, you have genes, as you see, that can control certain genetic conditions. They're involved in determining uh, gender. Um, they're involved in controlling um, sexual characteristics, among some other things. All right, so since females have two copies of an X chromosome, that means that for a particular gene, they can be heterozygous. Alright, so that means that for cells that are body, you can have two different types of population of cells where one of these X chromosomes is active and the other is inactive. You can have another situation where the other X chromosome is active and the other one's inactivated. Okay. This is called X chromosome inactivation. A purely random process occurring occurs during development. Alright, so here we're looking at a little calico cat. A little female calico cat. And these female calico cats can exhibit mosaicism. Alright, due to the fact that genes that control the pigmentation of their fur. All right, these somatic cells, the X chromosome for orange fur can be inactivated, meaning that the black fur allele is expressed. And other somatic cells, the other X chromosome with the orange fur allele is activated. The black fur allele is inactivated. So they'll have orange fur all right, so they look like a mosaic. They have both black and orange fur. And this is due to X chromosome inactivation. Now, this inactive X chromosome condenses into a little bar body. All right, so this little bar body looks like a little bitty drumstick. All right, so you're looking at a neutrophil, a white blood cell, and you can see the little bitty bar body is a little drumstick sticking off the, the nucleus of this neutrophil. That's the inactivated X chromosome. All right, so that means that cells, somatic cells in a woman's body, they can exhibit X chromosome inactivation and for certain traits, 
In one part of the body, one X chromosome is active. Other parts of the body, the other X chromosome is active. Which can lead to some interesting um, genetic conditions. Now, early on, we talked about this process of, of non-disjunction. And we talked about aneuploidy. We talked about abnormal numbers of chromosomes and gametes, either too few or too many. All right, and we talked about Down syndrome. All right, so trisomy 21. Well, aneuploidy, non-disjunction, is not only applicable to autosomes, it can also occur with sex chromosomes. All right, so you can end up with females that have one X chromosome, a single X chromosome. So these females exhibit a condition called Turner syndrome. All right, so these females are of shorter stature, all right, a broad chest, all right, have skin foldings in the back of the neck. They don't tend to undergo puberty or menstruate, and they lack breast development. Alright, so they have reduced size and functionality of their female reproductive system. Alright, but they are of normal intelligence. Here, we have a male that has two copies of X chromosome. Alright, so having a copy of the Y chromosome means you're male. Alright, here we have two copies of an X and one of a Y. All right, so they are genetically male, all right? But these individuals are sterile, all right? Their testes and their prostate are poorly developed, and they lack secondary sex characteristics that you would contribute or attribute to a, a, a normal teenage young adult male. All right, so body hair. All right, facial hair, uh, voice deepening, the um, hair that grows along the um, genitalia is either sparse or not present. The hands, feet, arms, and legs are really long and large. And these individuals can also exhibit gynecomastia or breast development. triple X syndrome, right? Females that have three copies of the X chromosome. All right, so they have menstrual irregularities, all right, early menopause. Jacob syndrome, a male that has two copies of a Y chromosome and one copy of an X. Alright, so these individuals are of taller than average height. Alright, so here you have a picture of twins. Alright, except for the fact that one twin is not suffering from Jacob syndrome, the other one is. You can see that the twin is suffering from the syndrome is much taller than his identical twin. They exhibit persistent acne, speech, and reading problems. Fragile X syndrome, all right, so this is not particular to a certain gender. Fragile X can affect both men and women. All right, so here a portion of the X chromosome is nearly broken off. So here you're looking at a female. This part of the X chromosome is almost removed. In the male, this portion of the X chromosome is just barely attached. All right, so extremely hyperactive individuals um, autistic. All right, so the face is very slender, narrow, really big ears. 
enlarged testes, uh, short stature, 